eight fifty nine. I think I'm gonna we're gonna start just a little bit early, a minute early, and go over uh, a couple things, housekeeping things that I wanted just to bring to y'all's attention uh, as we are uh, changes in the eviction. So um, I'm sure that a lot of y'all have heard that the um, eviction moratorium, the CDC moratorium, has been extended through the end of June by the moratorium. But there's another little wrinkle that's thrown in this is that um, the state Supreme Court of Texas, which sort of gives the instruction, which gives the instructions down to the lower courts, has not renewed those terms, meaning this, that in Texas, we are no longer required to ask for a declaration or to tell the court if there is a declaration in place, which means evictions now in Texas can happen um, and they don't, the courts don't have to worry about asking for the declaration. Now, this is a little bit confusing um, I've spoken with some attorneys to try to, you know, ask to break it down and, and, and how it works. And what happened was, is a few weeks ago, uh, there was a court ruling in Texas on the federal level that they said that the CDC overreached um, putting in this moratorium and overturned it so that it wasn't valid. That happened, again, about 30 days ago. What the courts were saying was, is that it's the state's responsibility to determine how eviction laws need to happen, and this should not be mandated on a national level. But the state Supreme Court of Texas had already adopted these regulations as far as how eviction should be handled. So on March 31st, or the end of March, um, when the moratorium was extended, the state Supreme Court did not extend that out. So what's happening is now is, and if, and if you haven't seen the statement that's come from Judge Hansen, we can get that sent out. Just email me and I can send you a copy with what he sent to me. He basically is saying this, we are no longer able to ask if there is a declaration in place. However, it goes on to say that if there is a legitimate declaration, you probably should not be evicting because we are still subject to that penalty if we are fraudulently evicting somebody and there is a legitimate issue there. So this is just from the courts on there. Um, you're going to probably want to speak with your own attorneys as far as how you want to proceed forward on an eviction. Um, after this meeting, um, I don't mind staying on the call as long as we need to, to be able to answer some questions on there. We've got some great information that's coming up, but I wanted to bring that to your attention. So if you didn't know about that, that's kind of what's rolling on right now. We're getting some uh, some best practices, hopefully coming from TAR and TAA to help us out on what we should be doing, but that's something that you need to be aware of. The next point that I wanted to move over to quickly was for the John Walton Scholarship Fund. Century 21, Tomorrow, between 11 and 1, is going to be having a fundraiser for the John Walton Scholarship Fund. They're going to be having a lunch out in front of the um, of their office on there. We want to welcome everybody to come out on there. They've uh, we're, we're trying to wait for a few things to come into place. I believe that Lubbock National Bank is going to be helping out with it. It should be a great time. Get the word out to your offices, to your friends. Love to see y'all out there um, on there. But we're they're going to be having that lunch in tomorrow, and uh, we're excited about that. Um, one other thing, I think that that is all that I had for right now that I wanted to, uh, bring up. Let me make sure that didn't have anything else. Sorry, guys, my other computer froze on me. Yep. So. Without further ado, I want to kind of bring in our guests that we have that are going to be speaking with us on there. Um, this was a subject that came up. Brenda brought this up, had a had a meeting uh, with somebody at, at CASA on there. And uh, y'all forgive me, I believe it's Patty. I don't know if Patty was uh, uh, speaking with Brenda on there, but uh, was talking about some things that came to our attention that was just kind of appalling. And dealing with sex trafficking on there and it had to do with some rent houses and I think they could probably give the details better than I can on there. And so it was a little bit of an eye-opening conversation having with Brenda is that this is something in our community that we need to be aware of. This is unfortunately is happening here in Lubbock. It is unfortunately something that we have to be aware of. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to bring some experts in to be able to tell us what to be able to look for, uh, have any questions. And so that way we can just try to at least do our part. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over 
uh, to y'all. And so I know that we've got a, a, a sorry, the our guests that we have from Casa, I haven't been able to speak with you. I spoke with Leslie yesterday on the telephone on there, but uh, welcome Stacy, uh, Kelly, Patty Castro, and Leslie Timmons. And then I believe that we have uh, one of our realtor members, police officers, Billy Mitchell, that's also on here too, to help out. So extremely thankful that y'all took the time. So I will let y'all take it from there. Um, all right, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, everything's yes, good. Okay. All right, so um, I'm Leslie Timmons. I'm the community community educator for Voice of Hope. This is Stacy. <laughs> Stacy is one Stacy Peterson is one of our sex trafficking advocates. Um, she mostly deals with juveniles. And um, we're going to do a quick, we're going to kind of take turns talking, um, presenting the PowerPoint. So we're going to do a quick PowerPoint. It's about 21 um, slides. And then we'll have um, an opportunity to do um, some questions afterwards. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and try to get my screen on real quick. All right, can everybody see that okay? Yep, Billy, I'm C, shaking yeah, your head. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so we are Voice of Hope. We're the, the Rape Crisis Center here in Lubbock, and um, we're going to talk about sex, sex trafficking in West Texas and what we've seen. Um, Billy's seen a lot of the same thing. Um, we're just going to talk about our services really quickly so you can, you'll understand why we are providing services to sex trafficking victims. We have a 24-hour crisis hotline, um, and that is also connected to the National Human Trafficking Crisis Hotline. So if anyone is trafficked out of our area, um, they will be forwarded to our crisis hotline. Um, we have the 24-hour medical accompaniment. So if anyone that has experienced sexual violence prevents at the ER, one of our advocates will be dispatched out. And that does include sex trafficking victims. We see, we see sex trafficking victims at, at the hospital as well. Um, these victims are going mostly um, to get a sexual assault uh, forensic exam. Um, but they also get medical care, they get, um, you know, medicine that they need and resources that they need. Um, law enforcement accompaniment, um, when they go to um, the law enforcement agency, we will go with them if they want um, to provide moral support and just be there for them. And then if a case goes to trial, we'll be, at, we'll be someone from Voice of Hope will be at the trial for them, just sitting in the audience, providing them moral support as well. Um, case management, follow-up and referral. We have a case manager, um, and that's a lot of what uh, Stacy does with her sex trafficking victims um, is let them know, you know, like where, where everything is in the criminal justice system. Um, we follow up with all of our victims that we meet and make any referrals that they may need. Um, we have two full-time sexual assault therapeutic counselors. Um, and so anybody that has experienced sexual violence that is seeking counseling, we can provide that. And then also primary prevention and community education. Um, so that's kind of a quick snapshot of all of our services and all of our services are free. We're grant funded through many um, sources, the Attorney General's Office, the Governor's Office, a lot of sex trafficking grants. Um, we believe it shouldn't cost to be a victim of sexual violence or sex trafficking. So all of our services are free. So what is human trafficking? Really, as I've seen Billy say many times and a lot of people that speak about human trafficking, it is modern day slavery. Um, it is stealing somebody's freedom for money, for profit. Um, human trafficking can be sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Uh, we just mostly deal with, with sex trafficking. Um, sometimes they overlap, 
Um, sometimes if you have somebody that is in labor trafficking, sex trafficking can also be involved. So um, we just kind of mentioned that. So technically sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, and provision, provision of obtaining, obtaining a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. And commercial sex act, meaning anything is a value is exchanged for a sexual act. It could be money, it could be um, it could be food, it could be, oh, sorry, it could be um, protection, it could be anything of value. Um, you you must prove that force, fraud, and coercion is was involved if the person is over the age of 18, but if they're under the age of 18, that does not have to be proven. So the kiddos that Stacy works with mostly out of the juvenile justice system, that that does that doesn't come into to effect if if they're under the age of 18. So just like I was talking about anything of value, food, drugs, clothing, shelter, transportation. Um, if a minor needs a meal, someone will provide them dinner in exchange for a sexual favor. That is what we're talking about. If that person has done that, that they, then they have committed a felony of child sex trafficking, anything of value that's exchanged. This is a little um, really quick little, little visual. You know, and we have to kind of change our language. Um, there's no such thing as an underage woman. It, it's, a, it's a child. And technically, legally, children cannot consent to a sexual act. There's no such thing as a child prostitute. Um, sex with a minor, that is actually rape. So we really have to kind of switch our conception and how we think about um, child prostitution, sex with a minor, all this stuff. There's no such thing. It is, this is, this is sexual assault. Um, so we have to kind of change our conception. And we, many times, you know, these, these victims are criminalized and they're looked at as the criminal. And we have to change that. They are the victim. Um, they are the victim. They are the ones that have been recruited into the life of sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So this is, to me, the most really sickening statistic that we talk about. Um, but the average age to be re recruited into sex trafficking is 12 to 14 years of age. Um, the sex markets we're talking about include pornography, stripping, escort services, and prostitution. Um, and if you're talking about 12 to 14 year olds, think about how vulnerable they are. They're a vulnerable population. They share everything on social media. Um, they share all the issues and problems that they're having on social media. And that's what predators are looking for. Um, you know, they may need a lot of help. They, they, and, and that's what makes them vulnerable. Um, in uh, human trafficking, women and girls are affected more than any, but any, any other gender. 99% um, of the victims in sex trafficking are women and girls. You want to do the definitions? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Stacy. We've got just basic definitions. Victim is a person recruited, recruited, harbored, transported, or obtained for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Um, then we've got the trafficker or pimp. A lot of our survivors will have different names for this person. Um, I am trying to make my brain remember to use the word trafficker because the word pimp has been glamorized within our society. Um, so a trafficker is anyone who has a person arranges clients for them and then takes their earnings. Again, we've got the buyer, John, trick, or date. Our ladies will have numerous names or different names for this person, um, lick, things like that. I've heard body count, stuff like that. Um, mainly, they're just going to say, have an, a different name for this person, but it's someone who buys or exchanges something for a sexual act. 
So this was a study that was done um, back in 2016 by the University of Texas on um, really the prevalence of economic impact on human trafficking. Um, and this group of researchers traveled around Texas for a long time and they went to agencies that provide services for sexual assault and sex trafficking victims. So they came to our agency and they spent three days kind of talking to all of us, going, looking at our stats and things like that. And so what I want you to notice is the very top number, 75, 79,000 minors and youth are victims of sex trafficking in Texas alone. So that 79,000, those are, those are numbers from Lubbock. Those are our numbers included in that 79,000. I'm not talking about girls that came over from Mexico or a third world country. We're talking about girls that were born here, that were raised here, and that live here. We're talking about domestic sex trafficking. And these are the numbers that um, this study came up with. Um, so that's, that's a pretty startling number to realize that, you know, this is happening in Lubbock and happening in Texas. Um, <clears throat> and why is it such a big deal? Because it's a very profitable business for these traffickers to be in. Um, you can see that it's a $32 billion a year industry annually. Um, it's the second, second largest and fastest growing criminal activity, second only to drug trafficking. Um, and that's because the reusability factor. Um, if, if somebody's trafficking drugs, they have to replenish their inventory, but these traffickers are selling girls, you know, 10 to 15 times a shift. So, of course, they're always looking for new girls, but, but they're able to resell and resell and resell, you know, a human as opposed to selling a drug one time. And they're making a lot of tax-free money off of, off of this industry. I'm going to turn it over. Get rid of all the faces. Oh, um, hold on. Let me. What if I did that? Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Stacy. When we're talking about trafficking, we have push and pull factors. We've got individual factors based on the gender. Um, unfortunately, right now we don't have a whole lot of males reporting or identifying as survivors. Um, we've got orphans, refugees, homeless children, widows, and or abandoned wives and children. How many of you know a single mom who would do anything for their child? Absolutely anything to make sure the lights were on, that they were fed. That's a huge vulnerability. We've got ethnic and minority. With the kiddos that I work with, um, I work with all of them. Um, but unfortunately, minority groups are a higher percentage um, of survivors. We've got childhood sexual abuse. Um, statistically, if a person is sexually assaulted, they're more likely to be assaulted again in, in the future. Um, and the problem with childhood sexual abuse is that is when kiddos are learning what a healthy relationship is, what a loving relationship is. And once they're sexually abused, they that kind of changes their idea of what good relationships are. So that's a huge vulnerability. We've got physical or mental disability, mental illness. We've got social and economic, economic status and poverty. Lack of education can, can come into play, but here's the deal. You can have a master's degree and still be vulnerable to trafficking. Lack of work or access to work. Again, what that boils down to is people will do anything um, to be able to survive. We've got lack of identity papers, birth registration. Mainly when we see that, the traffickers are holding on to that information um, as a tether to keep the victim close to them because we all know it's a pain in the butt to get your driver's license or your birth certificate, or if you're missing one, you need the other um, to get it. So um, again, it's just something that the traffickers use to hang on to their victims. We've got pull factors. Primary demand is typically male seeking fulfillment of the personal sexual desires. When I talk, I speak stereotypically that women are the victims and men are the perpetrators, but um, that's not true in every situation. It's just easier to do a presentation using the stereotypes. 
Um, we've got any person who purchases commercial sex, pedophiles, sex tourists. Um, personally, when I go on vacation, I like to go to the beach. But if your preference is five-year-old boys, you can actually book a trip through many different countries um, where you can perpetrate on five-year-old boys. We've got those who take advantage of their location, for example, military, truckers, business travelers. These are the people that are in town for a day, maybe a couple of hours and no one even notices them. If you're someone who likes to perpetrate against five-year-old boys, wouldn't you take advantage of it? They do. We've got secondary demand, which is typically motivated by profit. We've got the traffickers, pimps, madams, brothel owners, um, corrupt public officials. Perpetrators show up in every line of work. It could be your mom's best friend. It could be the principal. It's not only just corrupt public officials. And then we've got criminals and criminal organizations. Okay, vulnerabilities. What I'm finding is that if my most of my kiddos are runaways. So of course, um, when they're being forced to live on the streets, that is a huge vulnerability. Uh, 54,000 homeless young adults report being sex trafficked. Um, I had a kiddo who left a residential treatment center and walked to the bus station. And on the way to her bus station, she was approached by a trafficker, um, took the ride, and then she was gone. 31,000 were trafficked before the age of 18. Um, having been abused also comes into play. Of the 54,000 young adults, 41% had been physically abused by parents and 33% had been sexually abused before 18. For the recruitment tactics, we talk about grooming. The trafficker will target weaknesses, tell them what they wanna hear and give them what they need. If they want love, they will give them love and become their boyfriend. If they need a place to live, they will offer them, offer them shelter. If they're lonely, they'll become their friend. If they don't have a loving father, they become their protector. If they are poor or have low self-esteem, they sell that, that dream and offer a life of status. And they look for vulnerabilities. Our children are vulnerable online. They're vulnerable online, just like Leslie said. We're gonna talk about just some red flags that you can look for. Um, we've got a sudden change in attire, behavior, relationships, or material possessions. If you've got a friend who likes to get her nails done but can never afford it, once she, if you notice she's getting her nails done all the time, that can play into it. Um, we've got uncharacteristic promiscuity and or references to sexual situations or terminology beyond age-specific norms. A lot of these are going to be referencing juveniles. What I'm finding with my kiddos is they know a lot about sex and they have no problems talking about it. So um, that would be one that if that's the one red flag that you've got, um, keep looking for others. That seems just to be normal for these kiddos nowadays. Same with a boyfriend or girlfriend who's noticeably older and or controlling. Um, my 13 year olds like to date 25 year olds and the 25 year olds are stupid enough to date 13 year olds. So that's another one that if it's just the red flag that you've got, you might wanna keep looking. We've got an attempt to conceal scars, tattoos or bruises, a sudden change in attention to personal hygiene. Again, um, traffickers like to put money into their product. So um, traffickers will pay for their victims to be, um, to get their hair done, wear nice clothes, get their nails done, even um, plastic surgery. But it can also go the opposite direction. I had a little girl, um, that she was being sexually abused and in hopes to make it stop, she stopped cleaning herself down there. Um, so it can go the other way also. We've got tattoos, displaying the name or moniker of a trafficker such as daddy. We've got hyperarousal or symptoms of anger, panic, phobia, irritability, hyperactivity, frequent crying, temper tantrums, regressive behavior and or clinging behavior. What we're talking about is um, these victims are victims of complex trauma. So they are essentially sexually assaulted over and over and over and over and over again. And so at any point in time, you never know what you're going to get with them. They could be calm. Um, they could be dealing with their substance abuse. Um, so we just have to kind of chip away piece by piece, um, day by day, just based on what they're dealing with at that moment. We've got symptoms of daydreaming, inability to bond with others, inattention, forgetfulness, and or shyness. Um, a lot of times they will disassociate. Um, when 
an assault survivor says it was like I was floating above my body. That's essentially what's happening. And they will disassociate with you sitting right there. Um, generally, you've said something that might trigger them and then they just kind of disappear. So what we found is giving them um, the candy warheads where they're, it's really, really sour at first can help bring them back to us. Um, me personally, I like to chew on trident, the spearmint kind, because it opens my sinuses up and it just helps me stay present. Tattoos. Um, it's amazing that traffickers have the power over their product for things like this to happen. Um, I'm not sure who would want horror life on their body, um, but a lot of times we've got property of daddy's girl, diamonds, uh, dollar signs, crowns, all of that kind of stuff. And the beauty of tattoos is it's a conversation piece. Um, a lot of times they may not talk about what the tattoo means, so that gives you a clue as to what's going on. Other times they'll talk freely about daddy and how much they love him. So those of us who have ink, have ink, we all know we like to talk about it. So if you see tattoos, go ahead and just ask them about it and see what comes of that. I can't see you guys, but the question would be, who is the trafficker? And unfortunately, they all are. So this is the problem that we're up against. How do you educate people on what the scary person looks like when it looks like all of us? As we know, traffickers are predators who use another human being for profit. They sell people. Unfortunately, boyfriends or what, who they call their boyfriends are the most prevalent type of a trafficker. Family members are second most common. Do you want to go for this one? Yeah. So a very common question that we get a lot is why don't these victims just leave? Um, you know, maybe they're, they have the opportunity to, opportunities to leave and they don't. And there's many reasons, um, and we're gonna go all go over a few of these reasons. Um, false promises of security, love, and a better future, which is trauma bonding. Um, lots of these victims are in love with their traffickers because they've been, they've been groomed and they've been um, promised a, a better life than they have. Threats of violence against loved ones. Um, many of these uh, traffickers know that these victims have younger siblings and they'll use that against them, um, saying that they're gonna um, hurt, hurt their loved ones. Um, just a general feeling that no one cares. And this makes sense if we're talking about runaways or kiddos that are in foster care. Um, no one cares about them and this trafficker seems to care about them, so they stay. Um, they experience shame, self-blame, hopelessness, and resignation that this is as good as my life is ever going to get. Um, and they blame themselves for, for getting sucked into this life. Um, they could have a chemical tether. They could be um, addicted to, to drugs or alcohol. Um, and they're trained to fear and distrust anybody that tries to help them. Um, they don't identify themselves as victims. So that's probably one of the biggest challenges that's, that Stacy has is making, making that connection with these victims and gaining their trust and building that relationship because their, their, their trafficker has trained them not to trust anybody, law enforcement, social workers, you know, anybody that's trying to help them. And this has become their normal life. They, um, this is what it is. It's normal to them to have sex for, to just survive day by day. Um, so it is really, really hard, especially for youth when we're talking about youth to get out of this, this life. Um, you want to talk about this since you, since you, this is it is impossible for any single agency or organization to respond comprehensively to the problem of human trafficking. What we're finding is um, if Billy Mitchell runs into a case, um, he can't solve all of the problems in, by himself. That's where we at Voice of Hope can come into play. Um, I can be an advocate and hopefully gain 
that relationship that is needed to be able to keep that person around um, in case of um, the case going to trial or something like that. Uh, the response to human trafficking is most effective, coordinated and efficient through multidisciplinary and collaborative problem solving efforts. It takes everyone. It takes you guys um, noticing something in the, ho in the house and calling 911, then the police need help from whether it's DFPS or us as advocates. So um, it's a problem that we need as much help as we can from everyone involved. So what can you do if you see um, something? And, and we really say, if you see something, say something. Um, you can call the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, if you see something that you feel like somebody's in immediate danger, absolutely call 911. Um, you can also call the emergency line um, for at the, at the city for repeat, uh, reporting suspicious behavior. But really we, and, and you can call us as well. You can call and talk to somebody um, during the day from eight to five. Um, but if you see something, really notice the details, write it down um, because law enforcement investigates on details and they're gonna need as many details as you can. Um, but we really just um, encourage people to, if you see something, say something, um, get it off your plate. You know, because if you don't, it's going to eat at you and you're going to wonder, maybe I should have done something about this. Maybe it's nothing, you know, but maybe it is. So, um, you know, it's it's going to be better for your mental health as well, just to tell somebody and get it off your plate. And then that way, you know, you've turned that information over. If it's nothing, so be it. But, you know, it could be something and it could be that you're giving somebody, you know, a law enforcement agency or even Stacy, some information, you know, the missing information, the missing piece of the puzzle. Um, so, so that's, you know, some things that, that you can do. Um, you can, again, always call us. Our hotline is listed there, um, our website. Um, we're here again, eight to five. Um, our volunteers answer the phone after hours or on the weekends. So um, if it's that, if it's a situation like that, you can leave a message and somebody will call you back um, during working hours. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to get back. Okay, um, so that was pretty quick. Um, does anybody have any questions about the PowerPoint or what we talked about or anything like that? Comments? Uh, this is Paul Garrett and, and I'm just curious, I mean, this is vile and disgusting, all of this that's occurring. And I have a 12 year old. And so I, I don't understand why there is not a bigger, why there's not more outrage and why is this not more public than, than just this? And I, I'm just confused by that. And maybe you guys are confused by why there isn't a bigger outrage. Why isn't there more pushback or not pushback, but a bigger push from law enforcement and from government officials to say, this is ridiculous. We have to stop this immediately. Well, I think one problem is the lack of knowledge that it that it happens here in Lubbock. Um, I think, of course, we want to educate people. And so the more people that have that knowledge, the better. But I think people, the general public, tend to think that it doesn't happen in Lubbock, that we're out here isolated and we don't have to deal with the big city problems. Um, and it's easier, even if it's easier just for the general public to kind of sweep it under the rug and say, oh, that doesn't happen here in Lubbock. And we even, you know, sometimes when we're out in the public doing presentations like this, we still get pushback, like, you know, like we're exaggerating the problem or, you know, people just don't flat, just flat out don't believe us. Um, it's a hard subject to talk about. You know, it's still a taboo subject to talk about. Um, and so that's why we need, like Stacy said, we need everybody cooperating and educating and educating themselves and realizing 
what sex trafficking looks like. A lot of people, you know, again, assume that pimps look different or traffickers look different than they do. And, um, you know, that the victims are in this life voluntarily and they choose to be in this victim. So it really is changing the perception of, of the entire topic of sex trafficking. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm, I'm just sorry that it, it's, it's gotten to this point and there isn't more political pressure to stop it. Well, I think that, I think that a lot of people are coming around. Um, there's a lot of initiatives statewide. Um, lots of people are just now coming to the realization that this is a problem that they have to deal with. Um, our state legislation is, is pretty on board and have made a lot of progress. Um, law enforcement in Lubbock has, you know, they've made a ton of progress in working with these victims and recognizing, you know, recognizing what it looks like. So there is progress being made. Um, and that's what we want to make sure that, you know, that people know is that, that there is progress. It's slow. Um, sometimes it's, you know, three steps forward and two steps back, but, you know, any progress is progress. So, um, well, Paul, and I can follow up and I can tell you this, Leslie, it's like, um, <clears throat> Some of these slides that you were going through, I, I have a 10 year old and it, it was uh, <laughs> I'm almost kind of starting to tear up because you can't help but sort of put yourself in that situation as a parent. And uh, right. I will tell you this, and I don't know if you can do this really quick, but that you had a slide up there where you were talking about like under underage women on there. Um, mm -hmm. you can throw that back up again really quick on there. Um, it was a close uh, to the beginning on there um, where you were just talking about right there. That I think is that yellow one right there. This one? Yeah. Where I thought that this was pretty powerful on there and changing the narrative. I mean, it is, and, and going through this, um, trust me, I mean, I'm I'm no stranger to some four-letter words. <laughs> and so I'm not a, uh, a, a shy guy when it comes to these things, but it, it was pretty for me looking at these things. And, and this is telling an underage woman, there's no such thing as an underage woman. It's a child. There's no such thing as child prostitution. It's rape. And mm -hmm. You know, I think once you start taking the shine off of it and calling a spade, spade on right. there, it's powerful on there. And so I, I thank you for that. I'm sure that this PowerPoint presentation wasn't really designed to do that. Um, I, I think that that's maybe where some of the strength will be for y'all on there to do it because that's what it is. I mean, I've, well, I've never really considered and looked at anybody as an underage woman on there, but you are right. They are children at that point. And so mm -hmm. uh, I also want to thank you too. Uh, I don't want this to be the end. Oscar, of it, but I want to thank Oscar, you. Yes. I want to say something, Leslie. I had about, I don't know, it's been about four years ago. I had a detective show up at our office and we had a girl. She was probably 18 or 19. She was a little bit slow and um, they were using, it was just a little one bedroom house as a flop house. And he had told me that she was doing sex trafficking. She was going to the bars and picking up girls and taking them back to the houses, I guess, unfortunately for gentlemen to try them out. Mm -hmm. And I was just flabbergasted because she had a baby that was less than a year old. But just the criteria, as you said, somebody to love them, a daddy figure she didn't have. The people that actually co-signed on with her had no clue none mm -hmm. what was going on so um he they ended up we worked with them to arrest the gentleman and then she was then moved from the park so it does happen i was at, at, for 30 plus years i've done this and i just i've never had a detective show up in my office and to inform me that we have sex traffic i mean i just was stunned well, thank you for sharing that. I would I would say that that was a success story. That that the outcome was what it was because many times that that's not the case. So um, I would say you know thank you for you know helping helping that come to a successful resolution. 
Um, and if you said that, you know, you said she was kind of slow, so that would be another uh, vulnerability is that, you know, people with mental impairments are at huge risk for, um, for these predators. Yeah. And I mean, we just, we told the detective if he needed to get in the property, more than welcome to let him in. And uh, whatever information he was needing that we would be, you know, and he said, well, just don't get, don't be surprised if we call you at four in the morning and saying we're kicking your door in. And I said, you have at it, whatever yeah. you need to do. So, you know, like I said, I, I knew it's happened, but to have it happen under our nose and right. you know, we, we did inspections on the property. We walked through it. There was not anything that really stood out to us or anything, but it, it's, you know, that's as a property manager, you just, they, they're very common people, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I mean, they want to fly under the radar. They don't want attention drawn to them. They, they, you know, they're, they hide in plain sight, you know, and that's another stereo, a, a common myth about these traffickers that they're, they look, you know, like what you see with the big hats and, you know, jewelry and stuff. They, they don't want to bring attention to themselves. They want to fly under the radar of law enforcement and, you know, social workers. And so, so they really just live among us. That's Kendra, a good point. Kendra, I know you have your hand up for a question, but I wanted to give our other guests from CASA as well too, kind of a forum to be able to, to speak a little bit. And we'd love to, to hear your take and, uh, and um, hear from y'all. Oops, you're on mute, Patty. You would think after a year of doing this, we would know to click the unmute button before we start speaking, sorry. So this conversation came about, um, CASA met with Brenda who works for um, the Realtors Association here in Lubbock. And um, Leslie, can I get you to turn your share screen off? I'm gonna share oh, something. Uh -huh. I just wanted Let's to make sure. Let's see, stop share. Um, but when we were talking to Brenda, we were talking about the problem among property managers in Lubbock, simply because a lot of this is taking place on your properties. And so um, that's kind of how all of this came about. Um, one of your property man managers on this call today, Deborah Perez Ruiz, is one of our board members at CASA of the South Plains. So CASA are court appointed special advocates to children in foster care. And we know from FBI reporting that 60% of the children that are involved in sex trafficking are actually foster kids. So because they don't have the love and the family and the support wrapped around them, it's very easy for them to slip through the cracks and to become part of um, a target base for these sex traffickers. We have reports of a child, and I know that Stacy shared an example, but children that are actually approached within two hours of running away. They'll be approached on the streets by a sex trafficker. And we have to make sure that we don't have our blinders on and that we understand that this does happen right here in West Texas. Um, we at CASA, of course, we work specifically with the children in foster care. So when we have these types of situations come up, we try to wrap around these kids if they need to go to court and testify. Our CASA volunteers will go with them to those court hearings and make sure that they are supported during that so that they can actually identify their trafficker and make sure that they are brought to justice. CASA volunteers don't shame or blame. Um, we use a trauma-informed approach and strength-based lens when we're approaching um, a case where a child has been sex trafficked and a model of just healthy connections and relationships. Our um, collaborative family engagement program that we have at CASA, we try to find family members for these foster children, even if they're not going to be placement for these kids, but they can wrap around these children and start providing that support. Someone's who, someone who's going to notice if they don't text back or if they don't return that phone call or if they're not showing up at school, things like that, but a family member that is actually can be involved with them. And then our advocates, um, we advocate just for the survivor's best interest and for restoration and healing to take place in these situations. Um, 
there are local businesses right here in Lubbock, Texas, that are training their staff, their truck drivers, to recognize these victims. They are using their in-store cameras to screen faces as customers come into the building, running those through databases to see if they will hit on any missing children or reports um, of sex trafficking that have been made. So we're not asking anything of you that we're not asking of other organizations as well. Um, so don't feel like you're being targeted today at all. But it goes back to what Leslie was saying. If you see something, say something. And um, if you are concerned about making that report, please call Leslie at the Voice of Hope or call us at CASA, and we will help you walk through the process of making that that court or that report um, and like she said as many details as possible is always helpful but don't let that stop you from making the report you never know that a report may have been made previously or might come after your report that has a little bit more information or you're offering a piece of information that they were waiting on so that they could actually move to investigate that, to remove the child, to go in with a search warrant, whatever it may be. So make sure that you're reporting what you know as often as possible. Um, we have um, a case here in Lubbock we were just given this case here recently. It's actually four children. They are ages four to 12. They were brought into care because they were being sex trafficked. They were um, taken by a family member um, from Thursday evening until Sunday to a two bedroom, one bath property. And they were placed in these rooms on mattresses only. Um, there was three girls and one boy. The little boy was actually put in a bathtub full of water and they would have adults come in all day and all night to rape these children. The oldest girl had to watch her little brother being raped um, on top of her own trauma that she's experiencing. And so I need you to hear that this happens and, I, and not to traumatize you in any way, but I need you to hear it so that if you see something suspicious taking place on your property, don't automatically think it's just another drug deal. Not that that doesn't need to be dealt with, but those are adult decisions, making illegal decisions, but they're adult decisions. But check, call, do your research, watch that home, whatever you need to do, but make sure that we're reporting those things of suspicious activity so that children like these four babies can be rescued and can be brought out of that and so that hope and healing can begin for them. Um, CASA is always available. Our doors are always open. If you want more information about what CASA does, I can give that to you. Stacy Kelly's here with me today. We can share that with you. And like I said, um, Deborah Perez Ruiz, who is on this call, she can also share any information that you need about CASA. But we simply want to make sure that our kiddos are being um, protected and that they are um, and that they're being watched over. And that requires us to be extraordinary human beings and to make these reports when needed. I'll share my screen just briefly. This just has our um, our email. It's my email address on here and then the number at CASA. We're always available to answer any questions that you have. Even if you just have a situation where you're not sure that a report needs to be made, call us and we'll help you make that determination and help you walk through that step to make the report. Do y'all have any questions for me? Sorry, I did it again. I, we do have some questions that I want to um, um, get to, but I want to get to to our next guest, Billy, on there. I know that you've got a unique perspective in that you're in law enforcement as well as a realtor with us and um, would like to kind of get your take on things on there. Maybe you can sort of uh, give us some tips or your thoughts on this. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, Leslie with Voice of Hope and, and Patty with Costa, thank you for the, the, the presentation information. I, uh, I didn't bring a presentation as far as a PowerPoint. Um, I was asked to kind of cover some of the indicators and red flags, specifically with kind of uh, property management. 
and, and I wish I could. I wish I could sit there and say, well, you know, if you have one, two, and three, then then you got a human trafficking operation or enterprise. And unfortunately, it's just not that easy. Oftentimes, we're going to see these indicators, and, it's, and, it, and it could be an indicator of drug abuse. It could be an indicator of uh, mental illness or emotional distress. It could also be an indicator of a domestic violence situation. Um, and, and so the, the idea is, you know, the more that groups like CASA and Voice of Hope um, can get out and do some public speaking and, and provide that information, um, the easier it is for people to recognize it. We don't know what we don't know. And so that's, that's nothing on us. Um, Oftentimes, you know, I do presentations, but due to some security reasons, it has to be um, professional groups. And, and actually, that's why I'm able to come on today is because this is considered a professional group. Um, I'm excited also because I'm a realtor. And so anytime I can share uh, trafficking information with, with realtors is, is even better. Um, but the, the idea is... We have to show what Lubbock looks like for sex trafficking. Um, kind of to cover Paul's question and concerns from earlier, you know, the idea of sex trafficking is, is oftentimes we watch something, you know, we do our daily activities and we get in bed at, at nine o'clock and, and we turn on the TV to, to de-stress a little bit. And there's going to be a special presentation from um, a news media that, that covers sex trafficking and, and it talks about some young girl that was born in India and, and trafficked when she was a child. And she went through all over these, the country and all over the world. Um, and she was recovered. And now she makes, you know, bracelets or necklaces. And she shares her story. And that sounds, it's, it's an, an atrocious event that she went through. Um, but at, you know, 9.59, we turn off the TV and say, wow, that was crazy. Thank God it doesn't happen here in Lubbock. Um, and then we turn off the TV and we go to sleep. Um, unfortunately, uh, those similar situations are happening every day. Um, one of the reasons that it's not too public, Paul, is, is at least on my side, I do everything I can to protect my victim. Um, and, and part of that protecting my victim is not sharing information that can be released to the public. Um, if I, I don't want to slip up and put a name in in a search warrant um, and that turns around and is released to the public and not only does the trafficker have their name out there but the the victim gets their name or a family member gets their name and then it says the daughter of you know John Doe uh, was allowing was being trafficked in a, in a, you know, in a house and this and that. Um, and it's not too hard to get onto Facebook or social media and look up John Doe and notice that he has, you know, a 12, 13 year old daughter that also has a Facebook and this is her name. Um, and so that's at, at least in my perspective, that's why I don't release anything to the media. Um, and, and so that's how we go on about that. But you know, when it comes to property management, the best thing I can do is uh, recommend is just to, to kind of pay attention to what uh, what's going on. I think some some common indicators would be a, uh, a person who is purchasing multiple properties with cash for another person. And technically, you know, there might be some financial issues that go through the bank or through maybe even the title company. But at the end of the day, as realtors and property managers, we may not pay that much attention to that. Um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, that could be the red flag, that this person is buying two or three properties for a third person. And then when you talk to them about those properties, that they start to become real hesitant. And say, oh, well, they're, they're just a friend of mine and, and their credit is bad. Um, and, you know, they just, they just don't like to be you know, they're, they're a very private person and they just don't like their information out there. They could be, but that's also a, a position where we can say, you know what, this doesn't sound right. You know, um, most of the people that I know that, that manage property or own 
multiple properties, they're usually proud of the fact that they can say, you know, I own 20 properties within Lubbock and I use them for B&Bs or I use them for rent houses and I'm able to provide, you know, housing for people. Um, the, most of them don't say, well, oh, I just, you know, I don't want anybody to know I have these houses and, and I don't like money, you know, I don't like my name being out there. It's kind of a red flag. I uh, actually, as a realtor, had a client, a potential client call me recently. And that's kind of what they were wanting to do is buy a property, but give the money to somebody else so that person could buy the property because of credit issues or legal issues. And, and you know, I guess I could have sat there and said, man, they're going to pay me a commission. So who cares? But really, we have our license on the line at, when it comes to that. And and obviously, I don't want to be part of a legal situation as a police officer um, that's involved in some type of money laundering or human trafficking operation, as well as a realtor. So, so I ended up just kind of downplaying it and said, well, you know, once you get your legal situations, you can call me back. And, and you know, you just kind of have to make that tough choice because, you know, um, it's, it's how it works at the end of the day. Um, if... I'd love to say, you know, well, if you have somebody buying two properties and they and then come to find out they're going to have 10, 15 people living in there, that might be a situation uh, that might be like a foreign national situation. But you have to look at it culturally. You know, Americans, we want a bedroom per person. You know, I might share a bedroom with my uh, significant other, but uh I don't want my kids in there with me. I don't want my neighbor's kids in there with me. But culturally, some of these people from uh, foreign countries, it's very common to have five, six, seven people sleeping and living in the same room. Um, so you, you kind of have to take it, take it with almost a grain of salt. But just if, if it causes the hair on the back of your neck to stand up or it causes your stomach to turn a little bit and you say something's not right here, then something's not right there, you know. And luckily, with doing presentations like this, um, you know, we can reach out to each other. I teach at some educational uh, facilities, the local school districts. I teach some doctors in the hospitals and some nurses. And, um, you know, the point being is that hopefully – when you get off of this Zoom meeting or when you get out of nursing school or finish residency, you know, these people within the community, they'll turn around and, and they'll encounter somebody. And, you know, just using the names, uh, names on the screen, you know, Oscar's going to have, have somebody come and it's going to be a weird situation. And he's going to be like, man, I don't know. This just isn't right. So he's going to contact Matt and say, Matt, this is what I got going on. And, and Matt's can be like, yeah, that's not right, man. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be involved in that. And, and then you're going to talk to Paul and, and Paul's going to be like, Hey, remember, you know, that bald weird guy that talked about us, he's a realtor, but he's a cop. And, and remember that stuff he talked about sex trafficking and, and, you know, Patty and Stacy and, and Lacey, remember that zoom not too long ago that we had, maybe that's what this is. And then the three of you say, yeah, now, now we're going to start connecting some dots. And, and luckily, because of this Zoom meeting, we're going to have contacts. You know, um, I'll actually put my work email um, in the, the chat section and my, uh, my work phone number as far as my law enforcement side. And, and, you know, that's another, that's just going to be another avenue. You know, you can always call, you know, CASA, you can always call Voice of Hope, but, but now you also are going to have, you know, basically a direct line to the human trafficking detective for the Lubbock Police Department. And, you know, so you send that email and I respond to emails and, and uh, you know, I can say, yeah, I'll look into it. And, and if there's nothing to it, there's nothing to it. It's, there's no skin off my back. Um, but at the end of the day, that small, uh, that small bit of information can be um, what's what's going to bring down uh, an entire operation. I've, I've got a current case that I'm working that involves multiple girls uh, from Amarillo, Lubbock, Dallas, Houston. They're tied to one trafficker. Um, the youngest girl is 12. The oldest one is 16. And, and 
this afternoon or tomorrow morning, I'm going to be doing some search warrants and stuff that uh, all, all this information is coming from a Lyft driver, you know, and that Lyft driver just had this weird suspicion that something's not right. Um, and because Lyft and Uber, they actually provide human trafficking training and they have rules that, you know, about picking up minors and this and that. And so, but because of his, the hair standing on the back of his neck and saying, you know what, this sounds wrong. It probably is wrong and reporting it. You know, he, uh, he's providing some good information. So we're going to be able to get not only the main trafficker, but the houses that are um, harboring these runaways and harboring these foster kids, you know? And so it's a little bit of information that goes a long way for me. Thanks, Billy. Hey, and, and I'm going to kind of tack on to a couple of things with what he's saying on there. I know that we are, uh, as a community, we hear this, we want to be fresh in on there. And, and let me kind of tell you where I also think will be, where I common sense would help out on this is that whenever we put our company sign in front of that property on there, what we are telling our owners is that we're doing background checks, that we are validating the, the occupants that are going into those properties. And now more than ever, that needs to be a present that we have. When you have people that are coming in, run background checks on all the occupants. It doesn't matter if they're not going to be financially responsible, that if they're over the age of 18, you should be able to have them do a background check and, and check to see who's going on. Um, other recommendations that I would make would be is this, is look, at the end of the day, guys, we all know that within property, when we take on one property to manage, we're not going to retire off that one home. Our business is based off of volume. We have to have a lot of properties that are coming in and we have our systems in place to be able to handle that so we can make it on there. Let's not fall victim to just being sort of a rubber stamp operation on there. We need to get all the help that we can get. So recommendations that I would make is if you take a property into management, go take your business card and knock on the door next door and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be managing this property. We hope to get you a good resident, a good neighbor here pretty quick on there. But if you ever see anything, anything on there, give us a call. Let us know. Um, I know that every single one of you have had that phone call from somebody like, I don't want to get them in trouble or don't say anything or brought it up that I said anything, but they're selling drugs out of that house. We see people coming in and out, in and out all hours of the night. And I'll be honest with you, I probably would think like, yeah, that dude's probably selling weed in there. But I think we would all agree that it could be something way more nefarious than that. And in these situations. And so, um, you know, a couple of the questions that we have on there is like, you know, what is the first call we should make when we're suspecting traffic on there? Thank God that, you know, Detective Billy Mitchell is given his contact information on there. I think that that would be a great spot to start on there. Uh, I think some of our reservations that we're going to have is like, am I making a mountain out of a molehill? And, you know, if we have those folks that are willing to take on that responsibility and say, you know what, let us figure out if that molehill is going to be a mountain, then that's really all that we need to do. Um, the other thing that I have noticed, and I've spoken with a lot of security experts on there as well, is that making sure that you are taking care of the property. Um, and, and as property managers, we should be having those difficult conversations with owners about reinvesting in there. Now, I could be wrong on this. And Billy, you may have a different perspective on there. But I would imagine that where some of these two bedroom, one bath homes where kids are being dropped off, probably are not being well run. The properties probably don't look that great to begin with on there. And maybe that's why they think that's an easier target. But if you've got people that are going over there and you have vendors that are taking care of repairs or you are actively inspecting that property on there and there is a presence there to some extent, I would dare say that that might kind of detract some people on there. And that may be a little bit of a, a deterrent on there. And so I think that um, speaking with our owners and encouraging them to be more involved with their rentals on there um, and making sure that we're keeping those things clean on turnover and that um, will probably go a long way. So um, I'm hoping I did not saying anything incorrect there, making it too easy, but it seems like that'll help out on there. So um, I think, Oscar, yeah. Sorry, just to kind of answer that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, traffickers want to stay under the radar. And, and if they can find a property that, you know, is going to be uh, not managed properly, if, if you will, then that's what they want to look for. Um, and and as, a, as a police officer myself, when, when I was on the streets, um, what I found one of the best uh, ways to handle a situation were, were the neighbors. And whether it was directly or indirectly, and, and if you know, if 
kind of tech terrace where you have a bunch of uh, frat parties and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, the property manager, the homeowner may not necessarily care that there's a bunch of parties going on because, you know, they're just, it's, it's a rental property. They're looking for passive income. Um, but the neighbors care, you know, the neighbors care that there's loud music, the neighbors care that there's drug activity and stuff like that. And one of the things that uh, I always did when I was on patrol is if I went to a party call and they didn't shut it down, I went to the neighbors and I said, you know, I'm limited because I, I have to follow the constitution and, and the criminal justice rules. But if I were you, I would be contacting the homeowner and, and pitching a fit with them. Um, one of the other things I would do is look for cars that were illegally parked. And I would go down that entire neighborhood, that entire block and write citations for illegally parked cars. And when you wake up in the morning and you get a, a parking fine because of a uh, you, you accidentally parked on the wrong side of the road and, and down there in the bottom, it says um, illegal parking violations issued due to loud noise complaint in the area of, you know, 123 Avenue A. You're, you're going to take care of that, that house at 123 Avenue A um, as far as contacting the owner or the property manager and saying, you better get some better residents in here, you know. Um, so, so it helps. Um, as, as far as people worrying, I, I think at the end of it, everybody worries about getting, re, you know, retaliation or, you know, or, or getting hurt because they gave information. Um, one thing I always do is I do my best to protect the information that's provided. Um, there's some ways I can do that. But, and this is not a full uh, guarantee, but I've been doing human trafficking investigations for about six years now. And I've never received retaliation or threats or violence towards people on the outside um, and people that provide information, the property managers, the, uh, the school counselors, the nurses, uh, those are the people on the outside. All the violence that occurs within human trafficking is for the most part contained to the people that are involved as far as the victims and the traffickers and the buyers. Um, so it's not a full guarantee and that, you know, everything's going to be safe, but just kind of a reassurance that, you know, don't be afraid to stand up and say that this is wrong. Um, and it's, and again, it's the little things. I worked a case in 2020 that involved, um, a man that was harassing realtors across the nation. And it was an IP address that led me to him and a DNA test or a DNA sample I got from him. And we closed two cold case murders of uh, that was directly involved with human trafficking uh, because of his DNA, because of an IP address. So don't think that, you know, it has to be this smoking gun. You know, the smoking gun can be something really small. It, it can be that little molehill that that provides the mountain for us. And also some one other thing, and I'll stop it at, at this point. We'll open it up for any questions or if we need to move on. But, um, you know, I've fallen guilty to this where we have called the police and said, hey, we think people are dealing drugs out of the property. And uh, because neighbors have called and when we look, nothing's happened or we think that nothing is happening. And what we have to remember that at the end of the day that there, like Billy said, that there is a constitution that is protecting us and they have a particular process where they have to get it done right. Because if they don't do it the right way, it can't go to court, it can't get prosecuted. In the same way, when people are coming to us and they're complaining about their neighbor, we can't just go in there and kick somebody out. We have to do it the proper way so that it doesn't prolong the process. And so um, I have fallen guilty of being kind of frustrated, thinking that things aren't happening in the background. Um, it's kind of like good old Nick Saban says, trust the process and uh, do your part, put that, you know, our will on there. Our part is not to, to, to be the police, but to be their eyes and ears for them and help them out and to do with what we can. So I know that we could talk about this for hours and, and we, you've already given graciously over an hour. Or so to our guests, Leslie, Casa, Billy, thank you very much. Um, you know, if y'all need to run, we understand. If there's any other questions as far as property management stuff on there, I'm willing to stick around. Uh, but does anybody else have any kind of questions that we feel like maybe we didn't get to that maybe we need to get answered here pretty quick?
Okay, great. Um, last thing that I will be talking with and a little bit of house cleaning stuff on there for us on there. Uh, Bad, uh, Bambi Temple did um, want us to do a lunch and learn and I need three volunteers who would like to be on that panel for a lunch and learn on April. Ah, she, that's Friday. She just emailed me in there. I'm sorry. It is going to be on Sorry, guys. I wish I had my act together. She just emailed me. Yes, on April 27th. It looks like Kate is looking for a venue that we can be at. So if any of y'all are interested in doing that on the panel, please email me, uh, Oscar A at Cold World Banker. But uh, other than that, guys, y'all have a great day. Thank you so much for our guest. It was very enlightening. And uh, this will be recorded and y'all can rewatch. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar.